Hi everyone, uh, my name is Stefano Stabellini. I work for AMD and I'm one of the Xen maintainers. Uh, today I'll talk to you about static partitioning, missed criticality and Xen. Why static partitioning is useful? Um, in most common uh, scenarios, at least in embedded, uh, the software stack uh, is made up of, a multiple, of multiple components, only some of them critical to the functionality of the device. Uh, the largest amount of code and the highest number of components typically are actually not for the core functionality of the device, but they're for the UI or for cloud connect connectivity and other things that are important but not critical for the functionality of the device. So putting all of these components in a single environment is like putting all your eggs in, a, in a one basket. If something goes wrong, everything goes wrong. Uh, and um, a failure in your non-critical software could end up causing a critical failure in the whole device, including the critical function stop, stops working. Um, so using Zen and static partitioning allows you to have multiple baskets. So you can have your own um, critical components separated out in a VM or a domain. Um, and your non-critical component, uh, components, one or more, in multiple other domains. Um, by doing that, uh, you get uh, isolation from interference, from uh, fault isolation, real-time isolation. So if something goes wrong in your non-critical environment, your critical functionality keeps going, keeps working correctly, and the critical function is not unaffected. If your critical function has real-time requirements, they still keep working. You still get your real-time guarantees, no matter how big is the software or how busy is the non-critical environment. Um, and also, it allows you to deploy a, a software stack where only the uh, critical component is actually privileged. Uh, you can run large, you can run large amount of software and driver even uh, as non-privileged. Um, which is great, not just from a security point of view, but also from a safety point of view, especially if, safe, if safety um, certifications are part of the, of, of the design. So static partitioning basically looks a bit like that. You take the SOC you're working with and you are splitting it up. You're carving out two or three, like in this example, subsets and you're uh, directly assigning a subset of the hardware to, to each of these domains. So what are the same features that allow uh, static partitioning to work? The first one is DOM zero-less. DOM zero-less is a feature, it's called like that because it allows them to start domains without DOM zero. DOM zero used to be required, now it's only optional. DOM zero-less, enables a uh, static domain configuration before boot, given to Xen, and then start at boot time all the domains that you wanted without DOM0 having to do anything. Uh, DOM0 is still optional and could be there for monitoring, for instance, or for rebooting individual VMs. Uh, other features that are critical for static partitioning are real-time support, interrupt latency with real-time support, and cache coloring, which is, is isolation from cache interference which allows you to have very low interrupt latencies. VM to VM communication is often important to be able to exchange data between your domains. Safety certifiability is also very, uh, very critical in, in many environments where safety is part of the equation. Uh, and we have a number of activities uh, in relation to MISRA C and other uh, in, um, uh, important items for safety uh, that, we are, that are ongoing, but I'm not gonna talk about in this presentation. Um, so let's go through uh, an example configuration of Zen in static partitioning scenarios in a, with a step-by-step -step guide. And let's start with a, simple, the, with a simple first step, which is to configure the environment with three domains. So the reference board I'm using is Xilinx this U102. I'm using an emulated QM environment, but you could use uh, the physical board or target any other boards. Uh, the configuration is with Zen and three domains. Uh, Linux DOM0, which is not required, as I said, but I'm keeping it around, is useful at least initially for debugging, but uh, typically in production, then you could certainly remove it if it's not essential. Linux and Linux RT environment with a minimal uh, busy box init RD and Zephyr. 
So three VMs, and then we choose the memory allocation and CPU allocation for all of these domains. Uh, like I said, I kept them zero around, but generally one of the question when, we, uh, when choosing domains is whether you want to have a DOM zero or not. Device assignment is gonna be critical and it is gonna be configured in a second step. So um, it's gonna look a bit like that. So U-Boot is gonna load everything and then Zen is gonna start all domains in parallel. Uh, so the first step is to look at Image Builder. So Image Builder is really the reference point for DOM zero-less configurations. It's a set of scripts that you can use to automatically generate um, your boot scripts uh, from a simple text-based configuration file. So the one you see on the screen here is an image builder configuration file. You use it uh, as a parameter to the script, uBoot script gen that you see here. And then image builder is gonna generate for you uh, the uBoot boot script that loads everything and starts them. So the parameters here are memory start and memory end is a memory region to be used by image builder for loading the binaries uh, and loading itself. I mean, the, 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 the boot script. Um, Device tree is points to the host device tree binary. Xen points to the Xen binary. The DOM0 kernel and RAM disk are the parameters to specify the DOM0 kernel and the DOM0 RAM disk. DOM0 mem is to specify the memory for DOM0 in megabytes. The number of DOM use is a parameter to specify how many other domains you want to, 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 to start. Uh, the new kernel zero, RAM disk zero, are to specify the kernel and RAM disk for the first DOM zero less DOM U, which is Linux RT, with a trivial tiny busy box in it RD. The new mem is to give the memory for the, you know, the, the, the new mem zero, the memory of the Linux RT environment. I gave two gigabyte. The new vCPUs is to select the number of C, uh, CPUs for the uh, Linux RT environment, and I chose two. Otherwise, the default is one. And then the Zephyr domain, which has just a kernel, 128 megabyte is more than enough for the Zephyr to run. So uh, Image Builder generates for you um, uh, boot script, but you can configure and edit this boot script further in case you wanna change common line parameter or, or tweak some options, anything you like, you can edit it, and then from there, you can still generate with the command on the screen with a simple make image call, you can generate the boot.scr again. Um, so we talked about image builder, so we need to provide a few binaries. Let's start with Zen. So compiling Zen is simple and it compiles the same way that the Linux kernel compiles. So you just enter the Xen directory under the Xen repository and you type make. It works the same way as the Linux kernel. So you set the cross compile environment, you set the target architecture if needed, and then menu config optionally, otherwise it's just gonna use the default, the default config um, and then make. Uh, menu config is interesting. Uh, usually you would just use the default, but menu config is interesting because it's needed if you want to enable cache coloring that we are going to look at it later. Cache coloring can be enabled via a com with a menu config option. Cache coloring is not, it's not fully upstream yet, but is available publicly on the Xilinx Zen tree at this URL. So feel free to use it to give a look at it, use it even on, uh, I mean, on Xilinx boards, of course, and also non Xilinx boards. Um, what about Linux? So Linux, uh, you can just pull in any vanilla release like the 5.17, uh, that's what I use for the demo. Uh, enable config zen. So config zen is not required, but is nice to have because it gives you more option for the console. And also it gives you PV drivers, that are an additional way to commu communicate between VMs and for device sharing. So it's, it's good to have. It's also not adding a lot of code. So um, it doesn't increase your size of the Linux binary by much. So I think it's, it's good value. The other one that's good to have is the AMBA PL011 driver. So that's the driver for the PL011 uh, UART uh, to have a console. That is because when you run Linux as DOM0 as VM, you get an emulated PL011 UART. So it's good to be able to print on that console. Config bridge uh, is not required, but is useful in DOM0. 
uh, if you're gonna use PV network because the bridging version of PV network is the easiest to set up. Um, I just use vanilla plus two PV driver patches that are going upstream, already accepted and reviewed, but not um, committed to Linux master yet. Um, and I'll show you later how to use them. For the rootfs, now, if you don't have a DOM0 or you don't care about using the Xen tools in DOM0, like to start or stop VMs, then you can use any, any rootfs for Linux that you like. You can use the default Yocto, Ubuntu, anything. But of course, if you want the Xen tools, then uh, you need to pull them in uh, if you want to be able to you know, create new VMs and runtime, for instance. So in that case, at least for Yocto, those are the instructions on the screen uh, to just enable Xen to the build and get a rootfs with the Xen tools. Zephyr, what about Zephyr? So Zephyr thankfully has Xen support out of the box. So there is a Xen VM machine that is targeting a generic Xen VM. So you just use a Xen VM machine and for the, for the Zephyr build and it's gonna work. In fact, that's all you need to do if you want to run Xen as a regular Xen domain started from DOM0. There are a couple of additional steps needed if you want to run Zephyr as DOM0 less DOM U, so started directly at boot. Not very complicated, but after setting up the Zephyr build environment um, as provided by this link here, uh, you need to um, change in the device tree for the Xen VM board, you need to change a couple of options, but well, you need to rename the Xen underscore HBC console with Xen underscore console IO underscore HBC. You re the reason why you needed to do that is to enable, to switch the console that usually is available for the muse, so for, for regular domains, with the console that instead is used by DOM0 and DOM0 less guests. Uh, and then uh, just make sure to run menu config uh, before triggering the build. In the menu config, just enable Zephyr as DOM0 uh, and Zephyr the, the console for DOM0. These two options are needed again to use the console that typically is used for DOM0, but can also be used by DOM0 less guests. That's it, trigger the build and just use it. The, make sure that Xen has been built with debug enabled for this to work properly. All right, so before we go to the next step, I want to show you a short demo. So uh, I'm gonna run QEMU uh, here and, uh, and, and I'm just rebuild the boot script using image builder. And here uh, the, uh, the system is booting already. So what's going on here, I'm gonna scroll up while this is booting, is um, binaries have been loaded by TFTP at boot, and then Xen has been started. Xen is starting DOM0 and dom 0 less domains in parallel. Zephyr is very quick to start because, well, it's very small. So it's already printing hello world all the way up here. Then the two Linuxes are starting in parallel. Now in parallel, there is limited level of parallel here with QEMU, but you see the mixed messages of the Q2 Linux environments uh, on, the same, on the same console. Now, of course, if you have multiple serials, I would definitely recommend to assign different serial to different um, domains so that you don't get mixed messages on the screen, but also those they work. So here, this is DOM0, and I can see that there are a couple of domains running, and I, with control triple A, I switch between domains. The first one is Zephyr, cannot interact with Zephyr. Control triple A again, and now I am in the other Linux environment uh, and I can, um, I can do things. And I can check that there is no network. I'm gonna add the network in a second stage. Uh, so um, another things to look at here is like, the generated boot script. This is the source. This is what, if you want, you can customize any way you like and regenerate the boot.scr that is actually used to, to this is the, the binary, that is actually used to boot the system. Um, and this is the directory with uh, the binaries and the, the original configuration file for image builder that is the same as I described before. Right, so going back, so, um, 
Next step is to add physical devices to uh, each domain. So this is useful really in embedded if you, want to, if you can drive physical devices directly from your Linux or Zephyr environment. So in the example, I'm gonna assign the Ethernet device to the Linux RT VM and a timer, a TTC timer uh, to the Zephyr environment. Uh, device assignment is for sure the most difficult part of the configuration. Device assignment works as seen on the screen. So we need to provide a partial device tree, which is just a small DTB for, for each domain, describing the devices that we want to assign. The purpose of this partial DTB is to both describe for the domain the device, but also to tell Zen what to remap for the domain. So this example on the screen, you can see uh, there's a pass-through node under the pass-through node, everything is copied into the guest device tree. And uh, in particular, there is this Ethernet node, which is the one corresponding to the Ethernet device. You can basically start by copying the node from the host device tree into this partial device tree, and then make changes, make tweaks. What are the tweaks that you need to make? The three in balls here. First of all, you need to add any Xen specific configuration. The Xen reg tells Xen what to remap in terms of MMAO regions. Um, it can be usually is one-to-one, -one, like in this case, source and destination addresses are the same, but it could be mapped at a different address in the guest. Xen path is pointing to the corresponding node in the host device tree, because this allows you, if you wish, to have a completely different device tree description for the guest compared to on the host. This is not typically done, but that's what it's for. But normally, what, what you will do normally, is you will just use Zen path to point to the host device tree description of the same node. Finally, you need to make one last change. So in Zen is going to also remap the interrupts, reading the interrupts property, and um, the interrupt parent need to be changed to point to this magic number that stands for the virtual interrupt controller that get created for the guest by Zen. So you is not pointing to the real host interrupt controller any longer because that's for the guest. So this is pointing to the guest interrupt controller. That's it. It's not easy, um, especially because often these nodes have uh, dependencies on external things such as pin control, power domains, and clocks. So typically you need to just remove the pin control description and links or remove the power domain controls, but the clocks are required. So what you will normally do is keep the clock property and import any clocks uh, that are needed for this device. The reason is otherwise typically Linux, Linux drivers wouldn't work because they would try to probe and change clocks a boot. So um, after you have the DTB, the, these partial DTBs, you can just add them to the image builder config file like this, and they get loaded automatically. There is only one final thing that you need to do, which is mark on the host device tree these devices for assignment. You just need to add a Xen pass-through property under the host device tree nodes uh, corresponding to these devices, so that Xen knows that they need to be assigned. So we know that this is complicated and a bit too complicated, and we are doing two things to make it easier. So the first thing that we are doing is uh, at Xilinx, we, we have created a repository with a bunch of example partial DTBs for device assignments for a bunch of devices. And they can be used, simply you can look at them, you can use as a base, and they can even be picked automatically by Image Builder if you just write the path here in the Image Builder with the new pass-through path. However, keep in mind, this is not smart. So it's not generating any device tree. It's just matching by name the examples under the repository um, and finding the right one. And that's all. Uh, the, automatically, the automatic generation, we'll talk about that in a second. One thing to keep in mind when looking at these examples is uh, sometimes the name change in device tree. So for instance, the parent of all of, the, of these devices is usually called AMBA in older device trees and newer device trees called AXI. 
so make sure that the name is the same everywhere, otherwise there is a mismatch is not going to work. This is still is easier with examples pre-made for you, but it's, first of all, you require somebody to write this example by hand, and secondly, it's still too difficult. So what we're doing is we are aiming at, uh, aiming at automatically generating all of these partial DTDs. The way we are doing this is through another project called Lopper. So there is, um, uh, so we are working on an extension to device tree to describe multiple environments, multiple heterogeneous CPU clusters, and multiple VMs. It's called System Device Tree. Together with the specification, it, goes, it also comes an open source tool called Lopper. Lopper is a device tree manipulation tool. It can take a device tree as input and generate multiple device trees as, as output. So Lopper can be used to generate these partial DTBs. There is a talk at Embedded Linux Conf, uh, this conference, uh, to discuss how to use Lopper to automatically generate these partial DTBs. It's still it's very cutting edge, but it's possible. And that's gonna simplify greatly this problem. Once we assign the devices to the domains, then we need to use these devices in, your, in, this, in the guests. So what you see on the screens are the changes needed to add the TTC timer to Zephyr. This has nothing to do with Zen. This is just generic, the, gener the generic instructions to add a new device, a new peripheral to an existing board. So here I have added the TTC timer to the device tree description of the Xen VM board and then added the memory mapping for the TTC timer for the same board in mmuregions.c. Okay, before we move to the next step, I'm gonna show you uh, a demo. So I'm gonna regenerate the boot script using image builder again, stop the previews, uh, run and start QM again. QM is gonna start and uh, it's gonna fetch the new binaries over TFTP. It's gonna start all the guests in parallel. Now let me scroll up again while it finishes booting. So this is Xen booting, right? And then the loading the domains. Um, but Zephyr is booted very quickly, like last time. There is no hello world because I changed application. And now I'm using the TTC timer to print something every time there is a timer interrupt, every few seconds. And then the two Linux environments are still starting in parallel, as you see here. So I'm going to scroll to the bottom. And as you see, there are these messages printed from Zephyr, printing a timestamp every few seconds. I'm going to switch using Control triple A to uh, domain two that is Linux. And now I'm going to do it config and we have an Ethernet card. We have a S0 interface, which is the one that has been directly assigned. All right, let's go. I mean, I can go give you a quick look about uh, uh, the directory. So what I did here, I, I added the, the two partial DTB files. Uh, and you, I'm gonna open the Ethernet one. As you can see, there is a clock after all, in addition to the Ethernet node, the Xen reg, Xen path, and the uh, interapparent pointed to the magic value. Um, and on the host device tree, a Xen pass through property has been added uh, under the other node. Okay, then let's move on to cache coloring. So, um, if many of you will want to run uh, at least one application with real time properties, interrupt latency is very important and should be deterministic. In many of the, new, of the new SOCs, there is a shared L2, crack, L2 cache across the old clusters. What it means is um, activity on one VM, on one core, can cause cache line evictions that would affect the performance and the latency of another VM. This is not good because it's going to make you know, um, memory accesses non-deterministic and your interrupt latency might go up. The solution is to uh, use cache coloring to make sure each VM has its own dedicated set of cache lines. So each 
VM only access its own cache lines and another VM cannot cause cache line eviction that affect a different guest. The way to do this is by using cache coloring. So cache coloring is a smart technique uh, that um, understands the relationship between cache line and physical addresses and allocates memory smartly so that each VM only end up always hitting the same cache lines. The trick is allocating one page in memory every 16, as you see on the screen. But you, didn't, you don't need to worry about this. The only thing you need to care about is colors allocation. So a color is this small unit of cache line that you allocate to guest. So on ZCU102, there are 16 colors. Each color corresponds to 256 megabytes of RAM. So depending on your memory allocation to guests, you want to give different amount of colors. We here, we reserved one color for Zen, that is color zero. We reserved five colors for DOM zero, given that DOM zero has one gigabyte of memory. You can always provide more colors, which is okay, to not provide less colors than the amount of memory, otherwise it's a problem. One color to Zephyr, uh, given that it's only using 128 megabyte anyway, we'll be using less even. Everything else to Linux RT, that is the largest VM. And that is the way to do it in the config file by adding the new colors with a color configuration for your uh, DOMU, uh, so your regular domain. For uh, Xen and DOM0, you just need to specify the full command line by hand. And I'm gonna show you how to do it in a second. So let's switch to the console. Uh, so the configuration is here. So we have again the new colors. This is for Linux RT. Uh, this is for Zephyr. And here we specify the full Xen command line using, with the DOM0 memory, uh, the Xen color, the DOM0 color, and waste size is just for QM. So it's, it's normally on your physical. Uh, uh, board is now needed, is automatically detected. In fact, if you want to know how many colors uh, there are and how big each of them are, you can just start Xen with a, just a minimal coloring configuration and Xen is going to print it out for you. Like see here, it tells you the waste size, the maximum number of colors available, the Xen color that you configured, the DOM0 colors that you configured, your Zephyr color, and uh, the Linux RT colors. That is enough and sufficient to configure coloring successfully. Uh, and device assignments still work um, as you see on the screen. Okay, I'm gonna stop the demo and tell you about the last part of the configuration, which is share memory event and event channels. So to, for communication, the easiest thing to do is just to configure um, a shared memory area uh, between two VMs. You can then exchange data on your shared memory with a ring buffer, or you can use a library like OpenAMP. Um, and for notification, you can use event channels that are like software interrupts provided by Zen. So the configuration is you pick a shared memory address, like the one you see on the screen. Keep in mind that the address is important for your colors allocation because each address is gonna have a color, the color is defined by this number. So pick your address carefully. So this means it's color one. Um, and then you, you just use a shared memory, you map it at both VMs uh, and um, you can use it. For notification, you just need to bind event channels. How to do that? There is a header file, BSD license, that you can include in any of your projects that have uh, definitions for hypercalls and to receive event channels. Just use it, bind and event channels and just send events notification between VMs the way you wish. In reality, Linux has full support to event channels already and also Zephyr has partial support to event channel already. So most of it is already done, but if you are working on a different project, you might need uh, zen.h. Uh, we are working on, ARM is working on uh, def a definition of event channel and shared memory that can be done at the image builder level, device tree level, before the system is already started. That's gonna make it even easier and better for you. But what, you're gonna, what I'm gonna tell you now works already with the past Zen release. So you carve out a memory region, removing it from the memory node, and you instead specify it as a SRAM region, as you see on the screen. 
um, with accent pass through a specification to say this is, going, this is meant to be assigned to guests. And then you add it to the partial DTDs of both your guests, this SM region. You also need to add Zenforce assigned without IOMMU because otherwise Zen will always try to configure the IOMMU for you for safety. In this case, this is not a DMA mastering device. The IOMMU is not needed, should not be configured for this. So just specify Zenforce assigned uh, without IOMMU. Uh, finally, you just map the memory in Zephyr and Linux using normal techniques to map memory, so there's nothing special there. And then you um, send each other event channels. That's it. Now, uh, this is the code in Linux to map, to discover an SRAM region, and then uh, map the memory, allocate an event channel, write the event channel number on the shared memory for Zephyr to read, bind this event channel, and send notifications. So I'm going to show you this demo straight away. I'm going to start in the system again. Um, coloring is still enabled, but in Zephyr, Linux, RT, and Doom 0, all in parallel. In this case, Zephyr is receiving TTC timer interrupts instead of printing something directly, is writing the timestamp on the shared memory. Linux is reading, is receiving the event channel notification from Zephyr, reading the timestamp and printing it on the screen. So as you can see here, is actually Linux RT that is printing the timestamp. Zephyr is silent. So again, Zephyr receives the physical interrupt, writes the timestamp on the shared memory and send the event channel notification to Linux. So in terms of code, uh, this is Zephyr. It's basically waiting to until the shared memory is ready and reading the event channel number from the shared memory and then binding it. From that point onward, is just using the event channel hypercode to send notification to the other guest. Linux instead is using the powerful Linux drivers to allocate an event channel write the event channel number on the shared memory. And finally, for each event channel notification, it's just reading the timestamp and then printing the timestamp. There is one last thing that I want to show you. Uh, and this is PV drivers with Dom Zero Less. So PV drivers are powerful drivers that allow you to not just communicate, but even share a device, like share the network, for instance, across multiple VMs. Uh, in, this, in this example, in this run, I did not assign the network card to Linux RT. I left the network card in DOM0. I can still give Linux RT network access by using PV drivers. First, I call init DOM0 less, uh, that is a binary in DOM0 to, is a binary in DOM0 to initialize PV drivers. Then, I hot plug a PV network uh, environment into my Linux RT VM, and the network just comes up at that point. So I create um, a bridge. I created the bridge, and then I use I use Excel network attach, which is a command, sorry for the, uh, all the messages on the screen, but I use this command, Excel network attach, to hot plug um, a new uh, PV network interface into Linux RT. And switch into Linux RT, and as you can see here, there is now an S0 uh, environment. This is the new S0 environment, just hot plugged into my guest, I assign an, uh, an, an, um, an IP address and I can just ping DOM0 from it. I could wget a page from Google or do anything else. Um, so this is how uh, it works. So the, the good thing about this is that um, uh, you can still start your critical function very early at boot. You, you don't need to wait for, P, for PV drivers to come up. PV driver can come up later when DOM0 is ready. 
Um, and then, you know, the, this is how the communication is going to work. Uh, and the steps are the one you see on the screen. So you call init dom zero less and then Excel network attach. All right, I realize this is a lot to cover, uh, but the slides are going to be made available and the, the, the presentation is recorded. So uh, you can uh, slow down and look at the details. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation and I'm here to answer questions on, on the chat.